This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Darrell Rasnick and I am pleased to serve as one of the pastors at Church Street. Our scripture reading for this morning will come from the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, and so I invite you to take your Bible and begin to turn to that as we now listen to the Paris Adult Choir as they sing Ubi Caritas. Our reading for this day comes from the Revelation to John, beginning at chapter 21, verse 10. And in the Spirit the angel carried me away to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now moving to verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, the kings of earth will bring their glories into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, there will be no, need, no night there. The people will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it. Not anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river is a tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His face will be on their forehead. There will be no more night. There will be no light of lamp or sun, for Lord God will be their light, 
and they will reign forever and ever. May God bless the reading and our hearing of the Word. Why are we so fascinated with this book of Revelation? The Revelation of John, or Revelations in local parlance, is the most strange and difficult book of the Bible. Our relationship with this particular part of the Bible is either hands-off or all hands on deck. Respectable ministers of the Word strictly avoid it, except for perhaps a Reader's Digest version, cleaned up by carefully editing out those most difficult parts. In hushed tones and measured ways, we wade into Dante's Inferno, but only in the margins. One commentator has called this the good parts version of Revelation, which we find in our Revised Common Lectionary, even in the reading today, only using verses and chapters that can be conveniently explained. Not once do we hear about wars or plagues. Not once do we hear about dragons with seven heads or ten horns and seven diadems with their heads or beasts with ten horns or seven heads. Not once do we hear about seven bowls of wrath or the number 666 of the beast or the five months of torture or the four horsemen or the three foul spirits or the 200 miles of blood in a river. Certainly that's fine reading material, but we don't read it for leisure, and we certainly don't consider Revelation to be good bedtime reading. But Revelation is a mixture of bizarre images, creatures, symbols, and numbers. Sometimes we ask, is this really in the Bible? How did this get in here? But as much as we might try to avoid it, Revelation is the subject of art and literature and music, it's deeply ingrained in our culture, fascinating us beyond belief. Whether we realize it or not, we are constantly immersed in this dialogue with, a book, with this book. That's why many preachers find they just can't resist the opportunity to read into Revelation some message for us today. And usually that misplaced message has to do with the end times. After all, it is called Revelation. These apocalyptic themes pervade our popular culture today. Films and television shows portray these tales of how the story will end, God's consummation of time, God's story with us. I reserve that not only in the most popular literature of centuries past, but also in our time is this kind of writing something that tells us about our future so popular. We just can't get enough of apocalyptic literature. Luke Timothy Johnson at um, Candler writes a few parts about this part of the Bible saying, no parts have been so obsessively read so generally with such generally disastrous results as the book of Revelation. It's a history of interpretation that is largely a tragic misinterpretation. Arcane symbols, the nurtured delusionary systems, private and public, to the destruction of their fashioners, and the discredit of the writing. In other words, we messed up. Before we go forward with this conversation, so about uh, Revelation, we need to get a few things straight, you and I. The popular understanding that Revelation is a movie script that narrates the end of the world is utter nonsense. Doctrines of the past 200 years that espouse the rapture and the seven-year tribulation or millennialism only work by pasting together pieces of Scripture into a baffling collage of interpretation. Just as bad as reading only the parts we like is taking the parts we love out of context and doing violence to God's Word by twisting it into something it's not. Further, we need to rescue the words prophecy and apocalypse from the popular connotation. Prophets are not fortune tellers or predictors or spiritual meteorologists. Prophecy is not about predicting the future. Prophecy is about telling truth in the present in order to change what the future may be. Prophets call people back to God and hope that those people will listen and change their lives. To redefine another popular word, apocalypse is not necessarily about the end of the world. The word simply means an unveiling or revealing. We're used to hearing the word paired with trailers for disaster movies, but the term is really about pulling back a curtain of reality to see a, a deeper reality at work underneath. And so the message of Revelation is, is urgent, not because the book is specifically about the world's end, but because much early Christian thought 
grew out of the notion that Christ would return very soon. In that context, understanding that, John of Patmos prayerfully looks beyond the, the veil of the world's reality and tells the truth about the present. John's vision convinces him that true reality is a very different place from the one that he sees in which the Roman machine is in order. The empire had declared peace, the Pax Romanus, but John sees this peace for what it really is, a violent and oppressive regime that rules by intimidation, occupation, fear, violence, much the same way as our world today. To compose his vision into written form, John employs disturbing imagery, much of which is our imagination can barely fathom or follow. Through a series of spirals, John tells of visions multiple times that are increasingly unsettling until we come to the place we read today. Prose could not capture that vision, so John writes a long and often graphic poem. But the poem, it is. It is a poem that is not to be taken literally, but to be taken truthfully. The prophetic poem is epic and cohesive, but only read carefully. Far from being a narrated script ending the world, John's apocalypse tells about the truth of how God's kingdom exists in a far grander and vaster scope than the scary world around us. While John was writing to people of his own time, Revelation continues to be remarkably relevant today precisely because it's about God's kingdom, God's city. So if this book is so misunderstood and frankly misused, why has it fired our imaginations? The imaginations of writers and artists and, and ordinary folks like us for centuries. Why do we keep reading? Perhaps the most obvious reason is that we are constantly seeking a word from God. A sign of hope. I was reminded of this fact a few weeks ago in light of the latest acts of terrorism that fueled our imagination about what is possible in a scary world. In the midst of the Boston Marathon bombings, many people asked why it happened and could it happen to us? We watched the news accounts and we wondered if something as usual and wholesome as a marathon would be given over to fear and violence. In these days, there's plenty of anxiety to go around, and frankly, we wonder what God would say about it. So it only seems natural that we return to this book of the Bible. Revelation was written in the late first century, but that was a scary time in the world, just like ours. It's in the form of a letter from John the Apostle to seven young Christian communities. Fear and violence were the order of the day some most pointedly aimed at these fledgling people of faith. And in the midst of the Rev letter of Revelation, it was sent not to foretell the end of time, but to unveil the truth about the challenges that the church would face and about God's presence with them. Perhaps that's at least part of the reason that we go so wrong when we read it. The writer of John wanted to give Christians hope, not scare them, to help them endure, to encourage them in the midst of a scary time. We too live in a very scary world. We have lived through the most severe economic crisis since the Great Depression. Employment, health insurance, immigration, the housing market crash, all mean that the basic necessities of life, the things you and I need to live, are threatened. Whether we care to admit it or not, we are afraid of what the future holds for us and those we love. Wars and rumors of wars continue. Daily reports from far off places like Afghanistan and Syria remind us that war is not that far off. Most of us can relate to having lost someone to war or at least to the physical or psychological wounds of war. And there seems to be no clear end in sight. And then there's this constant threat of terrorism. Not even a quiet New England street can escape the reality that the cities we live in are dangerous places, brought on by factors we don't really understand. How do young immigrants, given the promise and hope of a great country, become radicals, ready to, ready to take their lives and, and, and to give their own? What, what does it mean 
that something as usual as a pressure cooker becomes an instrument of violence. We do live in a scary time. The part that should cause us to worry the most is that much of this death-dealing destruction is done in the name of religion. Those who blow themselves up on airplanes or in busy streets have a vision just as dangerously as those who preach prosperity in the name of God blame the joblessness and the poor on a lack of faith. They also have a religious vision, as do those who argue over immigration or health care or every other fundamental issue of life. So we, who would call ourselves Christians, also must have a religious vision shaped and formed in the experience of God through the Word, the Bible, and the world. We are in constant dialogue, wondering where God is speaking to us. No wonder people are drawn to an apocalyptic vision of revelation. No wonder we speculate about the world coming to an end. Isn't it this enough? Hasn't God's patient run out with us? After all, we are making a huge mess of things here. We choose war, humiliating our adversaries and beating and bombing them into submission. We shame the poor and the immigrant, offering them a small taste but never a satisfying fullness. We neglect our children and families, consuming goods that possess us rather than us possessing them, going through the motions of our religion rather than cultivating some spiritual health that would help us carefully listen and prayerfully to God, and so much more. These are all choices we make. The book of Revelation is a powerful, profound text, despite being so bizarre, just because it stands ready to speak God's word in the midst of fear and suffering. It acknowledges the hardship and suffering of daily existence while it also invokes a deep longing that we have in our hearts for fullness of life, a vision not of the end times, but of a world healed and made whole by God. In the 14th chapter of John, Jesus tells His disciples He will not always be with them. He's speaking to them about their fears and their anxiety and he offers them an alternative. Jesus said to them that God makes a home for them and with them, a place to live. Eugene Peterson in his poetic translation observes that God, God's offer is to, to move right in, to share the neighborhood with us, to choose to live in our troubles and conflict all the while envisioning something more beautiful. If we choose to live there with God, it is by embodying God's love for the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. Christ will be with us, even in the scariest of times, if we genuinely strive to love one another and live in a fullness of life. Today's reading, Revelation, offers a similar choice. Gail O'Day writes, The goal of Revelation is to invite Christians to, to move out of Babylon and to move into the grace of the city of God, a place of hope. And what city is it? The New Jerusalem. That's what John wrote about, a city that comes down from heaven, streets of gold and pearly gates. Yes, that's in there. There's no need for a temple, a place to contain God, because God is present in everything. The gates are always open, and the, gates are the gifts are abundantly available. The tree of life, abandoned in the Garden of Eden, is planted on either side of the water river and produces fruit for the healing of the nations. Kindness and justice, truth, grace, love, and righteousness reign. What a vision. We plea for it every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a beautiful city, not just about some dream in the sky. Certainly we don't discount that promise of the eternal, but that's where we get it most wrong. When was the last time that a preacher talked about heaven at a funeral and you thought, that will be great when I get there, but this vision, this word from God is about here and now, a life of God's presence now, a life that that God would have us live now and it mirrors God's glory today. It's a city of hope viewed from the top of a mountain and, and God has moved in. Revelation is powerful precisely because in the midst of our anxiety and fear and hopelessness, our dreams for the future lie with God who breaks into the present here and now. 
Revelation assures us that overcoming evil is easy, that love overcomes hate, that hope replaces despair, and that life overcomes death, all here and now, as well as in eternity. What are we waiting for and hoping for? If it's not this, this future present place, this place, one of our responsibility of the kingdom, one of our duties as citizens is not only to pray that God's kingdom come, but to live into the reality, to realize God's future now is to radiate God's love and healing and wholeness. To read these words about the city of New Jerusalem and to say, that's where I live. We must choose to live out and live in this place, the city of hope, this day and every day. We are to offer alternatives to live in fear and to ho live in hopelessness and violence or to move into the city of hope. Choosing the latter, we visibly live out our love of Christ for each other and for the sake of our communities, our cities. Frankly, cities are scary places. We all know the fear. But when we actively choose to live in the city of God, the place that embodies the fullness of God's hope for the world, and it lives grounded in that hope. I now invite you as we close our time together to listen as we hear our closing song.
As we consider today what it means to live in this great city of Knoxville and the surrounding communities, I believe God would take us on a high mountain and God would look out with us over this city and see a city of hope, a different place. The hope that we read of in Revelation, the hope of a beautiful, beautiful place with God, the city of hope. As we close today, as always, we invite you to come to worship with us at Church Street. We have Sunday services at 8.30 and 11. We have Sunday school for all ages at 9.40 in between those two services. As always, we welcome you to come and join us. Also for midweek communion on Wednesday at noon in our chapel. We would love to be your host and to have you come join us in ministry and mission in the downtown. As we close, may God bless you and may God show you a vision of the city of hope. Amen. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice.